Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another Pretty Gritty Tours virtual tour. I'm your guide tonight, Chris, and we are going to two of my absolute favorite small towns in Western Washington. As a native of Eastern Washington, I feel like I could do countless virtual tours or real tours, honestly, of all the little towns out there. But tonight we're talking about two of, as I've argued before, the most haunted small towns over here in Western Washington. One we've talked about previously, and I'm excited to introduce you to it once more. And for those of you who are new around here, this will be your first opportunity to get to experience the town of Bukota with me. And we are also going to be looking at Wilkeson, Wilkeson, Washington, which has a remarkably gory and violent and awesome history to it. And so much of that has been well preserved in the city today. So if you ever find yourself out on the road to Rainier and you stop in Wilkeson, uh, affectionately known as open Thursday through Sunday, it's it's worth the time that you can spend out there. So let's... Uh, Let's let's talk about these places. I want to make sure that uh, you all know that it is a live tour right now. So if you have questions at any point, please let me know. And thank you for those of you who tuned in last night for uh, our Joint Base Lewis McCord Peak Inside tour. So whew, here we go. Let's let's jump on in. So we're gonna start with Wilkeson because we haven't talked about it before and it's become one of my favorite places for haunted activity, but it has previously just been one of my favorite places for both history and just exploration. And this little township out here started in the 1870s. It has primarily been a coal mining town, but not strictly coal mining. It is also famous for its sandstone quarry. And this is what it looked like back in its early days. This was probably taken in, I'm trying to remember, maybe late 1800s, early 1900s. There was a fire uh, that struck in the early 1900s. And by 1910, they had made the decision to basically rebuild the majority of their structures with brick. Now, not all of them were destroyed in the fire. And in fact, the oldest building in Wilkeson today is still there constructed of timber. But what I love about showing you this one is you get to see pretty much switching back and forth between the contemporary and the historic. You see that little bend there as it goes off of Church Street up on the railroad street. The township has not changed much. And when we're thinking about Wilkeson, it is... Uh, like the quintessential Wild West town, a coal mining town with a stone quarry and a lumber skid row, all of this going on in this tiny little little township that was not, and this is important, a company town. So many of the little coal mining communities that sprung up out in the Cascades were company towns that had the Northern Pacific store and the Northern Pacific housing, and everything was very tightly controlled by the railroad. But Wilkeson was, for the most part, a, a free and independent community that just happened to have miners and lumberjacks in it. And so the, the wild lawlessness and the murders and the mayhem that took place at the time were all happening here. So <laughs> buckle up with that. Now, if you're also not familiar, just to give you a nod, Wilkeson Sandstone is the, the building material of the Pacific Northwest. So much of Seattle, Tacoma, and Olympia have been built with Wilkeson sandstone also throughout Oregon. And it is remarkable in that it is one of only two deposits that I know of, of naturally waterproof sandstone. And I don't want to geek out too much on rock right now because we're talking about ghosts, but it's a big deal and you should know about it. And there is still a sandstone quarry out there. They just do specialty small orders to the best of my knowledge. But they are still out in Wilkeson today, and if you're interested in the world's finest, easily moldable, no need to be treated sandstone, well, you don't have to look much farther than that. And when you're actually downtown, 
you can see a lot of vestiges of that sandstone, including the Wilkeson Town Hall, which began its life as a community center in the early days of the township and has transitioned over time into the town hall. But it was also uh, served as so many things and had the jail cells for the city for a long period of time down in the basement there. And I've been told by multiple sources that that's where the action is, that they'll hear um, just what sounds like a scuffle or a fight breaking out in the basement. And so people that are in the town hall, usually around nighttime, have to go down and be like, is someone inside this building brawling in the basement? And when they go down there, nothing but storage. Uh, I believe that the jail cells are still down there. It's one part of the town that I haven't been able to see yet. And here's something. I got to kick this off with a personal thing here. I went out and toured Wilkeson not that long ago. I was out uh, just in September. And I was taking pictures of everything. Everything that I could possibly take pictures of. I was snapping shots out there. And I get back to Tacoma and they're gone. All these photos that I took just gone. And not all of them. There were probably 10, 10 pictures of just key things that remained on the memory card. And it's so weird because I took pictures both with my phone and with my camera and same thing. It's the same photos on both that are gone. And I still cannot figure out what happened, but it has been bothering me specifically today more than anything. So You'll get to see, like, this is one that I took while I was there, but the other ones are just gone, and I can't figure out where they went. So if anyone else has had this experience in Wilkeson, let me know. Uh, another one of the buildings that gets a ton of reports of activity inside of it is the schoolhouse here. This is Wilkeson Elementary. It is from the early days of the township out here, and they used to have a, uh, a wooden structure that served as a school. And then they rebuilt this as a sandstone structure out there. And it, it has all sorts of stuff going on about it. One of the things I've heard is that uh, students that have gone to school there or continue are still going to school there will see what looks like an old timey teacher in the, the long skirt and petticoat standing at the end of a hallway, staring at them. And then she'll just walk as if she's going through a door, but goes through the wall. And more than one person has told me this story. They've been like, oh yeah, I was at the school and I saw her. They, they'd be like going to the bathroom in between classes or on their way to the cafeteria and just look like there was a woman waiting for them at the end of the hallway. And as they took a second glance to see if she was there, she would always walk away through the wall. The other thing that I've heard about this school is that there is a little girl that wanders around the hallways of it and she has a disfigured face and i have not been able to get my hands on the photos of this yet but that some students have said that they've been like taking selfies or they've been taking pictures of each other and it looks like in the background of these photos there's this little girl now if you caught our last haunted tour i had a clip that i'm going to share with you guys again today now this is not of the Wilkeson School, but it's um, from Deer Park, and it parallels a lot of the same stuff that's been happening in this school, and it's just a cool clip. So don't don't get angry at me. This is not from the Wilkeson Elementary School. This is from Deer Park, but it is a great clip, and I want you to see it.
So I really wanted to share that clip with you guys specifically because uh, I put out feelers on the internet early on when I decided to do this particular virtual tour. And I was getting some responses back about what people had seen over their time when they were there. And at least three different people had told me that they were in the school uh, doing like PTA events or whatnot, and that they heard just the sound of a chair dragging. And they thought they were alone in the school. And then they would see a chair just slide out from one of the classrooms into the hallway and just stop in the middle. And that it blew my mind because at least three different people sent the same response about that. I don't know if it was a coordinated effort on their part, but uh, as soon as I saw that clip, I was like, oh my gosh, it's exactly the same. So the elementary gets a ton of activity inside of it. The other one that people kept telling me about uh, is this. So it's an old um, Northern Pacific caboose. It became a static display historic element, I believe donated to the town of Wilkeson. And it's in the middle of town, more or less in this tiny little park. And as I started asking people about their experiences with the paranormal in town, multiple people have said that they've been like messing around in the middle of the night. And if they put their hand on the side of this, they would feel something. They would hear a voice inside their head urging them to do something and that they could never make out what the voice was saying, but that they always felt a desire to do something really violent. And it is, to the best of my knowledge, right about where the old uh, houses kind of like this would have been established early on. In between all the like three mining communities out there, they had a variety of homes out there. And because Wilkeson wasn't a company town, you would get a huge sort of spectrum of different houses out there. And I believe one of these was kind of at that juncture between church and railroad street out there. Now, if we're talking about the town of Wilkeson, I have to talk about its mining history. Of course, this is one of the, the Wilkeson mines out there. And while it operated primarily as a coal town with a sandstone quarry until 1938, uh, it had its ups and downs. And it has a huge coal deposit out there. And it's sort of uh, like second grade coal. Not the absolute best in the world, but pretty good stuff that you could use for a variety of things. And because it was such a huge deposit, all these miners were coming out and going out into the mines and bringing coal back. And this is a shot of early Wilkeson out here from 1909. And you kind of get a look at that like real pioneer town. So imagine this boardwalk, wild west town full of coal miners and lumberjacks and the incredible amount of just like wild drunken violence that was going on was pretty extraordinary. I think the wildest story that I've been told so far is at one point there was someone sitting in front of a building called the Washington Hotel in the early days of Wilkeson and the mayor comes out of that sandstone building that I showed you early on that had the jail cells in the bottom. And the mayor's just walking out of the building and this guy who's sitting in front of the Washington Hotel gets up, picks up an ax that was sitting next to him, next to a pile of wood, and he just decapitates the mayor. And when people tackle him and then he's put on trial for this whole thing, no recollection of it. Has no idea that he did it, says that he doesn't have any memory of it, just like, I guess I did. And then that's it. That's the end of the story that I can find it. And it's such a crazy thing. But I've seen other little whispers of that, of that corner, basically, where that Northern Pacific caboose is to the town hall, to the Washington Hotel. There's this repeat event of people just blacking out and doing something intensely violent. Wilkeson. It's, it's a much uh, more charming town today. I don't want to give it a bad reputation, but a lot of the tragedy there really comes from this time period here, including with uh, a local mine. So not the mine here in uh, Wilkeson, but they would have miners that would go between here and Carbonado and work in those various mines. And I think the largest mining disaster at the time was actually just down the road in Carbonado. And it took place with some gentlemen like this here. 
So you'll see a lot of the the mine structure still out there, which is super, super creepy. Um, but back back quite some time ago, uh, in 1938, there was a mining disaster out there when a 54-year-old German miner uh, took off his helmet and he lit up his corncob pipe at the time and accidentally ignited a deposit of gas out there. Uh, methane gas is a popular byproduct of coal mining and it detonated the mine. Uh, he was instantly blown to pieces and then another 30 miners at the time died in this explosion and a lot of them suffocated from black damp. And there's a variety of damps for, for my mining people out there. You can put in the comments to be more specific, but there's like orange damp, white damp, black damp. But black damp specifically refers to this methane deposit out there, which is both highly combustible and extremely toxic. In all, 38 miners that we know of were injured, 32, I believe, die. And one of the most tragic is um, this guy named Howell Meredith, who slid down an air shaft looking for his son, Daniel. All of these miners die at exactly the same time, and there have been multiple occurrences of people seeing them show up around town or seeing uh, what looks like the headlamps from their mining helmets coming back down the mountain towards Wilkeson. And one of the things that I thought was interesting is that one of the oldest buildings that is there today is what is now the Eagles Lodge. But at the time would have been a Knights of Pythia fraternal lodge. And each of these miners were Knights of Pythia members. And in fact, because they didn't have any sort of insurance, the Knights of Pythias at the time paid each of their families a certain amount from the dues that they had been collecting to take care of them. But I've been told that these miners have been seen inside the Eagles Lodge today, specifically the upstairs bar, and that they'll hear them chatting. People will be closing up at night or they'll be downstairs and then they'll hear what sounds like a group of men talking, glasses clinking on the upstairs level. And when they go up to the bar, never anybody there, but there will sometimes be a smell of like coal oil or smoke up there. Directly across the street is also one of the most haunted parts out there, specifically because just up the hill is where the Coke ovens were. And so if you've never been to Wilkeson, one of the things that they were really famous for wasn't just the mining of coal, but the coking of it as well. So they would bring the coal out on these, these rail cars up here and then dump it down into these ovens, which were essentially little beehive subterranean ovens. They would fill it up with coal. They would seal it shut. So just a little bit of air could get in, a little bit of smoke could get out and they would ignite it. And what that would do is essentially burn off the impurities in there and then create a really high grade fuel source with the coal. Now today, just across from the Eagles, those coking ovens are still out there and worth exploration at night because all sorts of weird things happen out there. People see shadows walking around, people hear the, the uh, like hand carts and the coal carts rolling along on the tracks out there. And to be fair, they do have tracks immediately adjacent to this now where the people of Wilkeson still do their hand cart races annually, but there's nothing out there during most times and people still hear it. One of the weirdest things I think I've heard someone talk about is that they've heard the round table. There's an old uh, round table where they used to turn the the trains or the cars around and it's just hidden like the depression in the earth where it used to be is just across the street from the hand car race tracks a little down into the ground and if you go through the bushes you can still see it but people all the time have noise complaints of hearing that thing moving turning in the middle of the night um here's the old coke ovens i'm gonna i want to take a look really quick i thought i had a really classy shot of that round table, but I don't know if I have it lined up for you guys. Another building, I'll see if I can find it later, that's super haunted and has its own little uh, Coke oven shaped 
experience inside is a pizza parlor today, the Carlson Block. And this old brick building is essentially right on the main drag there. And it was built as a hotel in 1910 by a pioneering businessman, a guy named Gus Carlson. And the original Carlson Hotel was one of those buildings that was destroyed in that fire. And so he rebuilt with brick, which is the smart choice. And this building has gone through a variety of, of different things. I believe it was a brothel for a period of time. It was definitely one of the most uh, frequented spots, certainly an old haunt for the people of Wilkeson throughout history. But it has all sorts of weird stuff inside. And today it is, like I said, a pizza parlor. And so you can you can go visit it today. It still looks very vintage and classic with all the brick inside there. And uh, I've been told that it has a tremendous amount of weird activity, specifically in the basement. And the basement is cool because during a period of inactivity when the Carlson block was empty, it was abandoned, it was actually used as the skate park for town. And if you are familiar with the township of Wilkeson at all, you probably know the bacon and eggs skate park that they just had installed out there. It is a giant, like massive industrial, uh, like cast iron skillet looking thing that has eggs and bacon statues in the middle of it. Sculptures, I'm not sure. And it's the skate park for town now. And that was built as a way to sort of replace what was lost when the Carlson Block building used to be the skate park. And I was told people would just go from the front door where there was a drop off down into the basement that you could just jump on down. Um, people have told me that you'll see people walking around the building in the middle of the night, that they'll be walking home down the main drag or coming out of the Eagles Lodge and just see like a light go on and off or someone walking around in there when they know that it's closed and the person who owns it is next to them. And they've been like, nope, Nobody should be in the building right now. Uh, another one that gets a ton of activity is this building. So what was once Kepka Jewelers has actually been turned into one of the coolest um, bars and soda shops in the state of Washington. Simple Goodness Sisters. If you don't know them, now you do. Uh, these two sisters are fantastic, and they started making uh, syrups for cocktails and sodas. And they purchased that old building and they've turned it into the Simple uh, simple Goodness Sisters Soda Shop. And they have told me that they'll have all sorts of weird things go on in the middle of the night. Things will get thrown down or things will move. And they started leaving out a shot glass of vodka in the middle of the night because they think actually it's the previous occupant of the building who's been coming back. And... He, he lived on the second floor of that building for ages and then ran a little shop down on the ground floor. And when he sold it uh, to them, it wasn't much longer after that that he eventually passes away. And they feel very confident that he comes back to the building in the middle of the night just to check on things. And if something disproves uh, his or displeases him, knocks it over. However, since they've been leaving out that vodka shot for him, things have gotten remarkably better. Also, right next door is a coffee shop. Uh, Nomad Coffee not only has delicious coffee, but they have so many weird things go on inside their coffee shop, not just in the middle of the night, but throughout the day. And if you ever find yourself in Wilkeson, go to Nomad Coffee, go to Simple Goodness, spend some time in the building because both of them are super eerie. And there is a brick that was signed by one of the people that used to live in the building just behind the cash register back there. And that is the like the hot spot that the people when they were there were having all sorts of weird things happen. And dogs, dogs won't come in to the coffee shop. You know, people have had their dogs that normally travel all around with them and they will sit outside, they'll stand outside the door and growl, staring at that back spot where the cash register is. And then like spook as if something comes at them really quickly. Uh, and multiple people have told me they've had the same experience there where they'll be like waiting to get their coffee. They want to take their dog in to wait or anything. And the dog just panics. 
Like there's something that really scares it inside the coffee shop there. All of these are, are good. All of them have really very visceral sort of terrifying things that happen to them. I think the two though that stand out to me the most are the, the Skookum Slope mine. So just outside of town is an old mine shaft, which is very much sealed up, insanely dangerous. I can't stress how dangerous these old mine shafts are. You know, we're talking about these damps, these clouds of toxic gas that pool and fill these places, making them both just ticking time bombs, but also, you know, people pass out and suffocate in there all the time when they go exploring. So don't. But um, I've been told that there are cries for help that come out of this particular shaft. The people will be hiking around in the woods. They'll be just walking around in the area and they'll hear someone screaming for help. And when they come over to see if there's anyone inside the mine shaft, they never hear anything. And as far as I know, no one has been recovered from these in the last 10 years. Uh, they do a really good job of keeping them sealed up, but you can see on there that there is a level of like, it's a gate that allows ventilation. And so people continuously hear voices out there. And for my time wandering around out here, it's, it's definitely one of the areas that just feels, I think the darkest and the heaviest. As far as the weirdest locations out here, the dollhouse. Now, uh, this is a private residence, so I didn't want to showcase it too much, but I will tell you on the historic walking tour PDF, which I can share a link to for you guys, um, there is a 1880s original structure still out there, and they call the dollhouse because it worked as a doll manufacturing place for a family out there. And I've been told that people have seen um, dolls just all around it, like in places that they shouldn't be, or that they'll make sounds when they shouldn't. And I've got something for you guys here of just the the creepiest doll story that I've ever heard about it. So when I was asking around about things that had happened in there, um, a woman told me that when it was a doll manufacturing place, growing up out there, she got a doll from it and that it would just stand up, that she'd find it in the middle of the night in the corner of her room standing up. If she put it in the closet, if she set it down, if she put it in a drawer, anything, just in the middle of the night, she'd find it again in the corner. And she never got like a, a disturbing vibe from it, not like it was intending to do any harm towards her, but that it would always just be so she ends up bringing it back to the doll shop. Uh, they were like, okay, it's strange that you're bringing this back, but we'll accept it, we'll exchange it for a different doll. And she never had problems with the second one. But the first doll she bought, she found years later um, when it was just on her front porch. She lived her entire life in Wilkeson. She told me that it would, uh, every now and then, just be on her front porch and she would put it away somewhere. Uh, and she, towards the end of that story, it was kind of like, I don't know, maybe it was a family member messing with me, but you could tell at the beginning, she was like, 100%, this doll is, is just around. And it is not an isolated incident in the area because just around the corner from the dollhouse is what I consider the absolute most haunted and truly creepy building out there, the old Washington Hotel. Now, here's a picture of the Carlson block. Looking down there, you can actually see the old Washington, and it is one of the only original uh, wooden structures from the town that didn't get consumed in that first fire. And it's there today. So not that pink one on the right. That's a, a new build from the 1980s. But the sort of pink cream one on the left is the original uh 1880 or 1884, I've seen conflicting accounts, tavern, brothel, hotel for the mining town of Wilkeson. And what's so crazy about this place is that it has all of the original pieces inside of it. 
And so this is a picture that I got of the front of it. And one of the only pictures that I took that stayed on both my phone and my camera of inside here. And it is full of dolls and mannequins and furniture from the 1880s. And you can see on the right there, that is the original 1880 bar back there. And down here on the on the knocker on the front of it, it's got the Washington Hotel little knocker inscribed and established in 1880 down there. And the story that I first heard about it was that when it was a, a bustling saloon and brothel, there was a woman that was brutally murdered there. And that there was a miner who got angry one day when he gets laid off. And so he comes down out of the mines he stumbles around in the forest for a while and then he comes to the corner and just stands and people have accounts of him just standing there staring out into nothingness. And then he goes inside and murders this woman. And, um, when, when he goes around, he like bends her. Who here we go. I've got the, I've got this visual aid for you guys. So in the back of the Washington Hotel today, it's sort of a forested area and people still talk about seeing uh, this guy kind of just stumbling around back. There. And inside the hotel itself, this is what it looks like. The, the mannequin, uh, they'll find them in different places. And it all happens around the area where this guy murders a prostitute. And then the creepiest story that I've heard about it is that someone will see her in the window sometime, but that it looks like she's bent or crawling around in an unnatural shape. And that they'll always just catch a glimpse of her through the window, thinking that it's uh, a mannequin that's fallen down or one of the dolls that's down there, but then it will look like someone crawls around the corner no part of them will be facing the right direction. Like I said, inside that saloon brothel today, uh, so many of the original pieces are still there. And in fact, uh, I'm hopeful that the new owner of the building who just purchased it recently will agree to allowing us to do uh, some showcasing of that structure as part of our in-person tours that we're going to start doing as specialty events in the town of Wilkeson. So stay tuned for that because uh, here you can see inside it's so incredibly creepy and wonderful in there. And it's got just all those original pieces and he bought it as a history buff because he wants to preserve the structure and, and do something great with it. Maybe turn it into a place where you could have, drinks again and come inside and see it. But he said that on the security cameras that he set up all throughout the building to make sure that nobody messes with it, he'll sometimes just get a shape. Like he'll see uh, like an alert show up on his phone in the middle of the night. And then the little box that moves around what would normally be a person moving across the floor, but nobody inside. Uh, for me, the creepiest room is the one here that has this tiny little clawfoot tub still there. I believe it's original and it's occasionally filled with um, dolls or mannequins. So there, some nightmare fuel for all of you. Please enjoy that. Uh, <laughs> as we take a quick detour now south to another uh, mining lumber town. And for those of you who know me, you've already heard me say it is one of my absolute favorite haunted towns throughout all of Washington state, the town of Bucota. Now Bucota starts uh, as the town of Siatco and Siatco is actually a indigenous word for the area that means um, haunted place or dark place. And it it is got stories about it being haunted that go back to the very beginnings of oral tradition out here. And it was one of the places that wasn't previously occupied by people as other people came out and settled the area. And there was just a sort of like weird stink on the place that no one wanted to live there. 
until they turned it into the Washington Territory's first penitentiary. And they build this massive two-story wooden structure to house the first, essentially, felons for the territory of Washington. And it was built originally in 1878 and then uh, was a private institution. So uh, a group of businessmen were paid 70 cents per inmate per day by the territorial government to house these guys out here. And when you're looking at this facility, you had to go up a staircase or a ramp on the outside of the building to get to the second floor. And the second floor was the only place where there was an entry point. You can see uh, the high windows on the first floor there, all the way at the ceiling, they had these uh, super thick, like Douglas fir timber walls that had, I think they were over an inch thick iron bars planted in there. And that was your only light that would get down to the first floor. Uh, and escape, I don't know that anyone ever escaped out of here, at least not alive. Because just outside of the town of Bucota is a cemetery just outside of Tenino. And that is the area where they think there was a mass grave dug for the first approximately 1,300 inmates that died out in that area there, if I'm getting that number correct, I believe. So uh, I want to share that with you guys as well. So let's see if I can uh, take you out there. But first, I want to show you the, the area where the penitentiary used to be and the area of Seattle. Because today, the town is called Bucota when it's not October. It got its name when they changed it. Uh, in 1890, they officially changed it to the town of Bucota. And essentially, it was the first two letters of the last names of J.M. Buckley, Sam Coulter, and another businessman, J.B. David. And so Bucota is the name of the town. But what I love about this place is every October, they embrace the spooky nature of town and they rename it by uh, proclamation of the mayor to Bucota. And they do awesome stuff. They have a pine box coffin derby. They have a hearse procession. They take some of their really old original buildings and turn them into uh, haunted attractions. So if you are interested in learning more about that, I'm going to encourage you guys to look them up. You can actually, I've made it easy for you with a handy QR code because it's 2021, but you can actually look up Bucota and their haunted house. They're running it Friday and Saturday all through October right now. And if you tell them that Pretty Gritty Tours sent you, you can actually get a discount for your admission into the haunted house, which is in an old 1930s haunted gymnasium. But I'll tell you about that in a second. First, let me share with you one of the creepiest things that's happened for me out in Bucota, just behind the territorial prison site, uh, where the, the origin of Siatco comes from. Certainly the beginning of this town starts here at what was the Siatco Territorial Penitentiary site. When this town first began, it was the first territorial prison for the Washington area. And the foundation of it was right here. The two-story wooden structure no longer exists today, but so many of those spirits still remain.
of the most truly terrifying parts of this town, right back here at the area where the old Siat Co Penitentiary used to be, there's a river. The Skookum Truck River flows at the back end here, and for me, it's the area that gives me the weirdest vibe and is also the place where so many people have sent us audio recordings or told us stories that they come down to this river at night, they'll hear something approach from the other side of the river, come right up to the water line, and they'll see the bushes move, but nothing back there. The audio that you're about to hear is from this area. Okay, the sound haunts me to this very day. Uh, over the years that I've been going down to Bukota, I've heard it now. And last time I was down there with Paul, actually gonna go to Joe's place. We heard it when we were driving down there and I hate it. I hate it so much and I don't know what it is, but it's, it's out there. For my paranormal investigators that have gone out in the area too and used um, like spirit boxes or EMFs outside of the town hall just lights up. And that area is remarkable too because there have been a significant amount of um, train deaths actually. So uh, people get hit by the train. I think they have something like 84 trains that go directly through town daily and there have been multiple instances where people have been killed by trains coming through the area and one of the most uh deadly ones happened in the early 1900s and people still um will hear like moans or whimpers in that area it there's a ton of creepiness to the town of bukota i think also one that i'm going to share with you here is of course um the dolls so if you know the town, it's it's got a bunch of terrifying dolls everywhere. Uh, one of the dolls that's most famous is named Abby. She is a little animatronic doll that doesn't have batteries inside her, but will still interact with people. Like she'll talk and dance around. And she's actually inside the haunted house. And you can go and talk to her, but she's kind of particular about who she interacts with. But if you're uh, not choosy about your haunted doll experience, just go anywhere. And I will show you here uh, the, the doll house, as I call it, because just downtown on the main drag is a graveyard of terrifying dolls. When I first started doing walking tours in Bukota, there would just be dolls on the street or doll pieces, doll faces and doll arms. And when I was touring one night, I saw this burned out shell of a house. And inside of it is a hive of dolls. And it, it collects new ones. People will find dolls from town inside this building. It's like they they migrate to it. They get called home to it or something. Which brings me to Abby the doll. I want to share this one with you as well. Uh, Abby, who lives inside, one of the only original historic structures in Bukota is a 1938 gym. There's all sorts of weird, weird stuff that goes on in it. And they've got security footage from inside of it where they'll see things move. And it's more terrifying because every year they set it up as their haunted house and so they put all these security cameras in there both to make sure that guests are safe but also to make sure that 
weird. Uh, nothing moves around. And so on that camera in the middle of the night, they get alerts all the time as things fall over, things fly across the room, um, entire displays will just collapse. Uh, and it usually sort of focuses around the epicenter of this doll, Abby. If you want confirmed hauntings and paranormal activity, you don't have to look much farther than this 1930s gym right downtown in Bukota. They have all sorts of activity going on here constantly. Now, normally this would be set up as the haunted house down here, but in the off season and right now, it's just an empty shell reserved for the ghosts in town. Not for me, friends. Not for me. <clears throat> Town hall, the dollhouse, the gym, which is now their haunted house. And I always, always tell people to go to Joe's place. Joe's place is a awesome bar. It is quintessential small town Americana. And it was the, as you might have guessed from the name, establishment run first by a guy named Joe. And when Joe sets up his bar out there, it becomes the spot in town, essentially, uh, and then gets hit by a fire. And several pieces of it burn down, but they rebuild even stronger. And the bar, the historic bar that's still inside it today is the original one. It survived the fire. Now, over the years after Joe eventually passes away, uh, Ownership remains in the family, but they hire different managers. And uh, the woman that runs it with an iron fist, I think, is the ghost that lingers inside Joe's place today. And I keep getting new stories about her. But uh, the one that I tell the most often is when a woman who was bartending there was closing up in the middle of the night. She said that she always washes the knives, dries them, and then puts them up on this magnetic rack. And that one night she was like, I'll get to it in the morning. It'll be fine. So she goes towards the back door where there's an old like uh, coal shed back there. And as she's going to it, one of the knives flies across the room and sticks into the wall next to her head. And she swears to this day that it happened. Um, you, you can look inside Joe's place, especially during Halloween. And it's already creepy because they fill it with mannequins and masks and stuff. But just by itself, when you're in there, you can feel it. There's sometimes just like an intensely cold presence right over your shoulder inside there. And I love it. <laughs> the doll stuff, I'm not as much here for, but haunted bars, spirits belong in bars, as we know. Uh, so the last place I'm going to tell you about in Bukoto really quick is the, the tree. And the Devil's Tree is a place that started sort of easy for me and has gotten creepier over time, but here's me telling you about it. The story goes that there were some kids playing out here in Volunteer Park when in the middle of the night, they just felt like an intense heat and they looked over and in the archway of this tree back here, there was a bright light shining through and they saw what looked like these slender figures crawl out through that way and other voices start beckoning to them to come down in there and that they realized it was an entrance to hell. Uh, I can tell you right now, there is a weird vibe out here in this park. Like it isn't, it's like, I don't even know. It's warmer than it should be. And it just gives me the weird creeps right now. Oh, Paul. Oh, Paul. Uh, I will say the scariest thing that happened to me out there was while we were out there filming, trying to see what was going on and get some footage for the virtual tour last time, there was a swing that just started swinging. And neither of us was close enough 
to have done it, but there were footprints through the wet gravel leading away from it. And this day, I have no idea what happened, but here you go. There's like a, a weird vibe out here that I can't quite place right now. But it's like, if anyone else can hear that there was like a really uh like loud boom <laughs> hey paul yeah. <laughs> where are you i'm behind you you see that the swing yeah yeah okay That is super weird. Did anyone run around out here? Just you and me, I think. The swing got me. The tree is weird. And I've been out there with people who have been more sensitive to paranormal energy. And the tree is usually the thing that pushes them over the edge. And I... I can't quite place my finger on it, but there is just a weird energy out there. And the park is always warmer than it should be. I've been there on evenings where there's a thick fog that comes off of uh, the Skookum Trek River right over there and never in the park. All around it, it is um, just clear and warm. Also, I would like to give a special shout out to the author of this, the Spookum Chuck River. They should also have a mayor's proclamation to rename it that every October because whew, that's some good stuff. So Wilkinson, Bucota, I can't encourage you guys enough to go out there. The last thing I'll give with you is of um, Forest Grove and Forest Grove Cemetery is beautiful and haunting. And it is the location where they think that mass grave of people who were uh, imprisoned over the years at the penitentiary there in Bukota ended up. It's believed that those that perished in the Seattle Penitentiary were buried in a mass grave somewhere out here in the Forest Grove Cemetery. That undisclosed location is somewhere on the fringe of the cemetery today. If you ever find yourself out in the region, I always encourage people to go to the Forest Grove Cemetery, especially if you have an interest in the paranormal, because it has um, so many opportunities to capture something on camera. And usually it looks like there's a heavy fog in the cemetery, even though you can't see it. Like it comes through on camera, but not with your naked eye and not on video. It specifically has to be a still photo, and I don't know why. Um, but I've tried it multiple times, and I like that. It often feels like you can hear someone talking at the edge of the cemetery out there. worth investigating it is a fantastic haunted season out there my friends and whichever small town you go and explore i really hope that you pick one of the small ones out here in washington because we have some phenomenal ones and each of them has a rich history and you only have to dig a little to find something spooky 
or spectacular. Again, if you find yourselves in Bucota, uh, do mention that Pretty Gritty Tours sent you and they should give you a discount on the haunted house. It is really good. I've gone through it a few times and enjoyed it every time. And also, uh, thank you, Dennis. I tie my own ties. Because this is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, if you know, I am currently an ambassador for the American Cancer Association's Real Men Wear Pink campaign. And if you can find it in your hearts to make a contribution to raising awareness for breast cancer and breast cancer screenings, um, you can save a lot of lives. And it would be uh, deeply impactful for me, uh, someone who has lost a family member to breast cancer, to know that that cause is being championed out there. So again, if you can find it in your heart this October to contribute to Real Men Wear Pink or the American Cancer Society, you can use this code here and I would be truly and sincerely forever appreciative. Also, if you've enjoyed your tour tonight, uh, you can always leave a, a monetary donation on the homepage of prettygrittytours.com. That's prettygrittytours.com. Or you can use the handy QR code right here. You may notice a theme these days. Next week, we've got quite a few exciting virtual tours coming up, and we are planning to continue them throughout, I guess, eternity, because people seem to be into them, and I don't want to let you down. But I appreciate you guys coming out tonight on this journey with me. If you have recommendations, suggestions, or things that you are interested in seeing or learning more about, always just let me know in the comments. I'm a happy to accommodate. And uh, my first passion is investigative journalism. So I'll, I'll go where the story takes me. But until then, my friends, thank you. Stay safe. Enjoy the ghost hunting season, and I will see you very soon. Keep on exploring.